welcome to another edition of Extra Bases with Bristol and Booth. Jason Bristol, Jeremy Booth. Jeremy, I don't even know where to start because you send out this tweet on Twitter and you're looking up right now and shaking your head, and I have to believe it has something to do with this draft. Uh, we are recording this on June 6th, day three of the first-year player draft. Where should we start? Is there a draft going on? Because I don't know. I can't tell if the hometown team did anything. Oh, you know, okay. I mean, Let's I'm, go from there. I'm Let's go, go there. I'm just going to dive into it. This is the time of year where, for all the work you've done with your scouting department, all the preparation from the summer, all the, the, the homework, years and years and years usually a preparation, you get to go ahead and unwrap your gifts. And that is selecting players to add to your system to allegedly try to win a championship. When you're picking – at the back of the draft, which the Astros are from winning the World Series, you're picking 28. Mm -hmm. You have to be really good at what you do. You have to be have all your information. You have to have your analytics. You have to have your makeup. You have to have your, your, your ceiling. You have to have your floors. You have to understand what you've done on the ground. You have to spend time with players because those aren't as easy to pick as when you're picking one, two, three, and four. OK, and so when you get to the back of the draft and things fall in your lap, yeah, there's some safety you pick because you kind of know what you're going to do here and there. It depends where you do that. You always want to protect the, the ceiling picks. But the key op the operative word in that statement is ceiling picks. You have to have some kind of impact and some kind of ceiling. And when ceiling falls into your lap and you don't take it, I got a problem with it. And I imagine we're talking at number 28, the Astros selecting Seth Beer outfielder Clemson rather than the player that you believe was the best hitter in the draft on the high school side, that being Noah Naylor. This kid Naylor almost went in the top 10, and I'm not going to get into where because it's, it, it, he went 29 to Cleveland right behind the Astros, and that's a really good organization for him, Jay. That's a really good place for him to be. They develop well. They work hard. By the way, an analytical-minded team. Okay, mm -hmm. And I talked to Scott Barnsby after they took him, and I sent him a message. He said, man, it's great to know you feel that way about him, and we love this kid and can't wait to get him in. And they need to be very excited about Noah Naylor. But the Astros had a missed – opportunity you got a kid considered as far up the board as three that falls into your lap at 28 and you walk for what the safe college kid with power nothing against Seth Beer because you can get him in the second round you probably could have got him in the third round no matter what you could have gotten you. Seth Beer in the third a round. a guy like Seth Beer okay if it's a not guy him. like Seth Beer okay that type of guy is a one trick type of guy he's got to hit the ball a long way and it's like the Feltman kid we talked about who has velocity right that would be that, Durbin Feltman who we talked TCU closer we talked about him in the last and podcast. what round did he go in he went third to the Red Sox. And that's exactly what we talked about before in the last podcast. You could take him at two if you thought he was going to get there, but he was a third-round guy. That's got to come off the board at that point. And the Astros decided to take what I would call safe. Well, what's safe about it? Because if he doesn't hit, and we took a guy in Seattle like that, DJ Peterson, mm -hmm. who we thought was absolutely going to hit, and he's a better player than Seth Beer is. Sorry, at least he was at the same point. And now you've got something where Seth Beer comes in here. And, again, I'm not trying to kill the kid entirely. Don't misunderstand me. But when you compare Seth Beer to what you could have had in that position, that's a miss. Money, how much of a factor was that? Depends on the organization. I, I, I don't want to – I don't want to – I know that Mike had a quote, and I'll let you get to that in a second, with, with when it comes to the money part. But college players usually have less options. But Seth Beer's a kid that went to college as – went early to Clemson because you want to be a Clemson Tiger. College is a very safe environment when ba in baseball for players. Professional baseball is not. It is a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and you got to have some serious heart and some serious fortitude to go ahead and make it. And if you want to go to college early, that's a concern to me. I saw Seth Beer from the time he was a sophomore in high school, and he can flat-out hit. Okay, at least he could then. He can drive the baseball. However, you have to have enough to get there. Mark Capel had a 100-mile-an-hour fastball and a plus breaking ball and went his first-round pick twice, and the Astros took him once. And um, where's he right now? I'll wait for it. Oh, he's at home. He's at home right now because the makeup said, we're not sure what this guy can do. And he got out there and said, you know, professional baseball isn't for me. Okay. So, you know, you got you got kids fighting for that with ceiling and, 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 and floors and options and versatility or younger. They can go ahead and do it. Money shouldn't be a factor. You sign who you can sign, but not there. All right. Let me be uh, the devil's advocate. Seth Beer has big hit tool, power, and hitting from the left side. Left-handed hitter. That short porch, Minute Maid, this is a guy that put up 35 homers a year for the Astros. Okay, so they Who cares where he can play? Better... We don't care if he can play first base. We don't care if he can play DH. We don't care if he plays right field. We just know that he can hit. They got a guy who I love as a human being, mm -hmm. who I think was a really good hitter, who was a Golden Spikes Award winner in A.J. Reed. Mm -hmm. Took him in the second round. Where's he? And I, and I had A.J., and I had him, and I've and I've worked with him. And when we after we worked together that one off season, he hit thirty four home runs. And had a, where's he? Right, guys that just have that one tool 
they become hard to place after a certain time. So would you value J D. Davis ahead of Seth Beer? I would now because of the. Po- you would now. I would now because he he has a true position. He's had a, he has a position. He can't, he signed as a third baseman. He's got a position. Um, to me, he's a better pure bat than what Seth Beer is going to be. And you taking one trick guys is is that's one trick means one tool on the scouting sale scale. Taking one tool guys is very risky, and you can find those guys anywhere. You don't have to take them in the first round. And even if you love this guy, how do you pass on a high ceiling kid that's going to sign for a slot right behind you? How do you do that? You can, you can and, see and and granted, we don't draft for need in baseball. We draft the best player. We draft best player available. But on the flip side, catcher's a position of need. Mike I, Elias I, said that. You can't find good catchers. I, and just, I don't get it. I don't get it. And, and we're looking at a window right now. The Astros, as we talked about a bunch of times, and keep in mind, for those of you listening outside of Texas, we're based in Houston, Texas. So the Astros is, is a focus for us, certainly after winning a World Series. Um, the players that were drafted, with the exception of Alex Bregman, at the big league level right now, were not drafted by Mike Elias, and they were not drafted by Jeff Lunau. The only one they presided over, I guess you can say they presided over, were, um, were Lance McCullers and Carlos Correa. Okay, Bobby Heck drafted those guys. David Post, who's now in San Diego as a national cross checker, drafted those guys. I'm waiting for the impact player who isn't taken second in the country to show up at the big league level in a way that's going to help this organization sustain the window. Okay, this window is here right now. Charlie Morton, who's arguably one of the best pitchers in baseball as we sit today, okay, has actually still said, "I'm not sure I want to play anymore." That's it. That's guys. I mean, I don't know what to tell you when you're talking about refilling. So. You, what's in the system after a draft like this? If you look down the first, the top 10 rounds, when there's, there's taking up to 24, 25 rounds as we sit today, top 10 rounds, the guys that stand out to me are Cody Deason, RJ Fury, the kid out of Maine, the shortstop Pena, right, who you mentioned, uh, the Schrader kid from who we'll talk about in a second because I got a good report on him from, from the Northwest, and Seth Beer. And I would take the kid on the second round over Seth Beer from what I just got. Okay. Okay. And I saw Schrader last summer, but I would take him with what he is, what he's got, his upside can be. I'd take him over Seth Beer. There's guys who went in the fifth and sixth round, I'd take over Seth Beer. And I know that if everybody's got a unique perspective, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, that's not a pick you take at 28. And I was not on the conference call with Mike Elias because I was working. Jake Kaplan from The Athletic quotes Mike Elias. So I'm guessing this came from the news conference, if you will, the mm-hmm. conference call with reporters. I'm not 100% certain because I wasn't on it, but I will credit Jake Kaplan from The Athletic with this uh, quote in his draft article only because I was not on the conference call, so I couldn't hear what Mike Elias said after the selection of, of Seth Beer. In some ways, and this is talking about the heavy emphasis on college players, every single player, with the exception of one, the second-round pick, the high school pitcher, has been college. This is what Mike Elias says. In some ways, it was how it fell. We had some high school players who were, we were eyeing, especially in the third round. But the reality of it is high school players are typically much more expensive than college players because they have big college commitments that they've yet to enter into. With our situation this year, with a smaller bonus pool and picking lower in the rounds, there are just fewer and fewer of them available as you go. But we're very excited about landing Jason Schroeder or Schrader. I'm not quite sure. Doesn't matter. Second round, we think he's a huge high school pitching talent than the college picks that we selected before him and after him we think they are going to be big additions to the system we texted last night about this and I don't have an opinion yet because I don't know all of these prospects however this does have a very money ball field money ball feel to me from this draft and I don't have a problem with that I don't have a problem with that because analytics are very important in the game however um some of these kids, I just I don't know I don't know what the upside is in, in, in them, um, and I have no problem picking small college players. I have no problem picking players from smaller schools, if you will, not the power conferences. But overall, it it seems kind of underwhelming to me. Underwhelming is a very nice way of saying what I'll say is they punted the draft, and they won't tell you that I'll say it. And I'll say that because, you know what, I've been in the room, and I understand what it means these guys to go out there and do it. So to understand why, how this, how we got here today and why they did taking Mike Elias' words as fact, nothing else, just fact, that's what they did. They're picking in the back of the draft. They're looking for safe. They're looking for floor. They're not looking at ceiling. They're looking at numbers. And what the Astros did was they fired a bunch of scouts before the year started. Okay, that's all over baseball. They did that. It was well documented. And what ends up happening is that they turn around and they use cameras. 
and they use spin rates and they use all this information that should help to augment what you're seeing and to supplement, help you make a better decision-making process as the decision maker. And so that is the problem. You don't have the feel for the player. You don't have, I don't care what you do. When you cut your scout and staff by half, you can only see so much baseball. Okay. So in that type of situation, what you get is something that's tangible. And in college baseball, because the quality of who they play is much more consistent mm-hmm. because the stadiums are better mm-hmm. because the setups have more money. You're much more able to have a better handle on what you're taking. And there's a track record because you can track them. There's reliable statistics. The fields are very much like uh, minor league stadiums, not some high school that, I mean, certainly high schools in Texas, we see this, but I know of high schools in Pennsylvania, they don't even have an outfield fence. Sure. This draft looks much better, I guess I would say, if you had something with some upside. And Mike Elias' comment says, we believe in Jason Schrader or Schroeder. We believe in him. And what I heard on Schroeder and Sh- or Jason Schrader is that he's 91 to 96 with two breaking balls, kind of a Jeremy Bonderman type, a little bit bigger version of, version of that, which means he's going to throw really hard. He's going to have to be power reliant. Um, and he has some feel for the strike zone. But we've got that guy in J.B. Bukowskis. That's what that guy does. Throws real hard, right? So if you're going to keep finding these guys, R.J. Furry in the sixth round is, is a pretty good pick because that's a college reliever that throws 100 miles an hour. I've seen it myself. That has a one-and-a-half type guy that can be a big league reliever in the sixth round. And that's where you get those guys. You don't have to take them up top. So when you're looking at what we what we did, from going for ceiling, it's enough. For going for upside, it's enough. For going for safety, it's an A-plus. All right, you got safety in a known quantity, but you don't have anything that's going to impact the organization except for maybe Schrader and pieces down the line. How do I know this? Because every organization that's ever tried it that way has had the exact same result. This isn't the first, this isn't new. This isn't the first philosophy. These guys came on the backs of, to use Moneyball, Billy Bean and Bill James and what they did in Boston and what they, how they put all that together. The Astros and Jeff Luno, while innovating in their own right, which I'm not taking away from them, have absolutely, they're not, this isn't original thought for them. This is taken from somebody else's school, and they're trying to do it better, and that's okay. But once again, there's no upside here to impact the organization, and the system that already has lost its upside. Okay. Let me play devil's advocate again. Sure. You're a scout, former scout. You have a lot of friends in the business. You have a lot of contacts in the business. You're just bitter because a lot of the guys, um, they may be your friends or things like that, that the Astros let go, that they're doing something different, right? That they're doing something that's not the, what, what baseball is used to. And, and that's why you feel this way, that these guys aren't necessarily guys who are high upside guys. Is that Okay, no. I, number number <laughs> I'm one. I'm just saying that's what no, some people it. might say. Sure, that's so, what so let's, some people let's, might hear you and say, "Okay, well, this no wonder this this is an old school guy, which you aren't, but you are part of the scouting community, so of course you'd be against the Astros let's, and let's, what they're doing let's because dive into because this. this is non-traditional." Let's di- I'm glad you asked that question because that's something that I think, and I'll go ahead and say it. I'm not speaking for anybody else other than me, although I am comfortable saying there are others that feel this way. Okay. That's that's not that's not the case. We all those of us that are, that are baseball purists at heart, meaning we love the integrity of the game, want to see the game succeed. We all recognize it's bigger than us. It's bigger than one person, and it should be. It's it's been a national game, and it's been a global game for a long, long, long time. And truth be told, I'm pretty happy doing what I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not like for me when I've had opportunities to go back to major league clubs, um, there's there's an issue there. This isn't an axe to grind for me. What this is is if you have a better way to do it, then make it a better way. Don't turn around when you have a chance to impact an organization which affects players, affects the city, and affects the integrity of the game and punt it by saying, oh, well, you know, we don't want to spend the money. Or, you know what, these guys are more safe. Go ahead. That's the, what's the best way to build an organization is through the draft. Free agency is way more expensive. Mm-hmm. And you don't get a chance. If you punt that, you're doing the city and your ownership a disservice. How's that? Good response. Okay, so when I turn around, I listen to good guys like Bobby Heck in Tampa Bay, and they took Libertori in the first round, and they've continued to build the entire way. And they took Tanner Dodson in the second round or in, at 71, right? And they're going to turn around and let him play both ways. We're, we're talking about finding a better way to do things. When you're looking at San Diego and who they took, better way to do things. You know who's in San Diego beside J.J. Preller? David Post, who is a national cross-checker here, which along with Bobby Heck built the players in the big leagues right now. So I'm sitting here, and I'm not trying to sing the praises of only two guys, and I'm not trying to say that Jeff Luno doesn't have a good track track record by himself as an evaluator in St. Louis because he did. He Mm -hmm. had a great job there. I'm saying this draft right here, especially coupled with the last draft, you have a couple of these back-to-back-to-back, and we were in Seattle, and I can tell you what it did to that organization, will not yield what happens after this five-year window. I like McKenna. I think McKenna has the potential. I think he's a guy that can play, uh, from what I've read, multiple positions in the outfield. Okay. He's a guy that's produced on the college stage. Um, your reliever from Pittsburgh? Furry. Furry? R.J. Furry, I believe. Furry, furry, but it's 100 miles an hour yeah. breaking ball. I mean, Pitt. 
And I think that uh, certainly uh, Chandler Taylor, the outfielder from Alabama, maybe there's something there. I know he's had some 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 injuries, I okay, believe. See, where are we talking about? Five to seven range? Yeah. That's where you get those kids because Michael Elias is right. After the third round, those high school kids don't sign. Yeah. Okay? He is right there. And Austin Hansen, the reliever, here's another guy. Uh, Austin Hansen, here's a guy who also has a big – a big fastball. He's a short guy, so I imagine he's going to be a reliever too. You have to. So if you're taking relievers and you're taking, you know, one one tool guys, you don't have to do that at one and two. You can do that after the third round. That's where you do it. It's after the third round, unless you have a guy like the Feltman kid, who we, you know, although he's over the top, it's a hundred. It's a little bit of a breaking ball. It's enough to get guys swinging and missing and stuff like that. These guys just went too far in the numbers, too far the other way. And when I look back at what they've done, really since Mike took over the draft and since they took it over in this in this scenario, um, developmentally. And in the system and with the changes that they've made and, and missing what the, the philosophy that got them there at the top with Alonzo Powell from offensive philosophies and, and the things that they've done, it's underwhelming. This is a great word. It, it, I don't see where the upside is in this draft. And, look, if I'm wrong, I'll be the first person to stand up and say, I was wrong, you guys are right. Everything I know over whatever amount of time, everything I've ever been taught by my mentor is completely out, out of the box. And, guys, I'm, I'm going to tell you, though, for, for a city – that has a window of another three to four years to be in contention. That window is going to close. And the Astros picking at 28 was conceivably going to pick in the back of the draft for a little while. Had a better, obli- more, a bigger obligation to the city, the club, and ownership, and the players in the organization now to find a better, to, to actually take players with some ceiling. And they didn't do it. And when I saw Noah Naylor fall and fall and fall, I was thinking, oh my goodness, there's the guy. There's a true, Im- I mean, Baseball America had him as the number two bat in the draft high school. Yeah. And he plays a premium position. Now, I don't know if he can stay there. That's the big knock on him. Yeah, well, he, he can stay there. But the one they liked better than him was what, Kellenic? Yeah. And Kellenic went to the Mets at six. And yeah. I know because I can tell you the Mets loved Noah Naylor. They loved Noah Naylor. And what happens ahead of you dictates what happens behind you. Look, the A's did something no one, none of us saw coming, too. And they took Kyler Murray at nine, who's going to go back and play football at Oklahoma, at University of Oklahoma, right? That's not going to end well. Is I, it, it going to end well? I don't see it ending well. But, I mean, you know, it's not like the Astros are the first people to do something that's unconventional mm-hmm. or do something that people, don't, people disagree with. Every organization has to answer to themselves first. Mm-hmm. Okay, the fans second. However, you look across the board here. And picking at one with the guys they took four to eight, four to ten, I guess you can take an argument for those guys at any given point because where you're picking in the draft and the probability of those guys making it to the big leagues and being impact. But if you can get ceiling, you take ceiling. You have to hit a home run at some point. You can't just hit a single. I do have a little familiarity with Austin Dennis, uh, the line uh, the linebacker. <laughs> <laughs> the infielder they just took from Middle Tennessee. Um, he's he's a utility guy. Uh, yeah. He's a small, 5'11", 165. Um, you know, he's a little guy, can play a lot of different positions. To me, he's more of an organizational type. And, you know, that, what, that's... What round do they take him? He's a filler. So, again, we're out of the impact rounds, and we're trying to find... This is where you take... This is the 20th round, which I still think you can find guys every once in a while. Sure, you can find a Tyler White here and there. This is where analytics need to come into play is, is now, because show me what I can't see. Are they relying too much on analytics in this draft in the sense that I looked at some of these uh, guys, these pitchers they took, high strikeout per nine innings rates, which I'm, I'm okay with, but sure. I, you always have to consider the competition. <sighs> It's hard to say this organization never or at any point doesn't rely too much on analytics because it's really analytically heavy. Mm-hmm. But, what you know, we're, we're, we're coming off a World Series championship here, and I'll, I guess I'll answer it this way from the top down. Before they augmented the big league club last year the way they did, this team wasn't going anywhere really, right? It was, it was kind of peaked. Mm-hmm. Something had to change. And, and the, the insight on this information was that Jeff Luno and, and the club realized that they'd gone too far the other way in order to save themselves and save what they, what they were in charge of. They had to go back to some old school work. And their scouts on the ground did a lot of work to help them get to where they were last year and win a World Series because that was the right timing. Mm-hmm. What you're seeing after that is a reversion now that they've won a World Series all the way back the other way. Okay, now we're going to use cameras. Now we're going to use this advanced technology only. And we're going to have guys basically go in and, and have, you know, from the Carolinas. I have one guy who's got New England to Florida. Wow, not that's, a, that's, a, big, that's and, a big and, and, area. And that may be a slight exaggeration because I'm not actually in, in that territory, but that isn't much if it is one. And he's got to see all those players within that. Well, how do you see 2,000 players? Or ordinarily, you'd have four guys doing that coverage, maybe five, and each guy would have 150 guys in their list that they, cro- that they would see or 200 they would see to get to 60 to 70. So how are you going to see 1,000 players? 
you're not going to do it. You can't do it. So you have to focus in on where you're going and it doesn't allow for any changes or anything like that. I, I just, I guess what I would, I guess I have to answer it this way in that if you do it one way only and you rely on what the computer is going to spit out, you will fail. One player that's uh, Michael Wilansky. Who? Michael Wilansky, infielder from Worcester. Worcester, Mass. And I was, I, I must admit, the 18th round selection, shortstop, don't know much about him. He played in the Valley Baseball League, which has certainly um, produced some players. It's one of the lower tier college Virginia. summer leagues. Yeah, Virginia. And he was the um, hit 432 in that league. 18 doubles. He was uh, the All Star team MVP of the league, which all sounds great. And then you look at where Baseball America had him on their league top prospects, which is compiled. They um, they talked to both scouts and coaches. Where was he? He was ninth in their top ten. So that's a production guy, right? That's a production guy that they don't see a lot of projection. It's production, more not not so much projection. It's an organizational helper. Yeah. You know, and so I, I guess what I'm saying, which is all right at that sure, at that but, at that. But age. the guys they would if the guys if, if they're right mm -hmm. if they're right on Seth Beer, he's Jeremy Giambi. He used to play for the Phillies in the That's A's your comp. That's my comp. He's Jeremy Giambi, and he hit some home runs for a couple of years, and he's out. If they're wrong, he's nothing. If they're wrong on the Schrader kid, they got more time with because he's a high school pitcher, right? He's a reliever. That probably helps you. Mm -hmm. If they're wrong on Decent, he's nothing. If they're wrong on Freary, guess what? He's nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, all this emphasis on velocity and the guys at drive line will disagree. That's okay. They can disagree all they want. There's a lot of 100 miles an hour. Fastballs get hit the other direction. Okay? You have Straight. to be able to pitch and do something with it. And you can't pitch with that, this much intent the entire time. And that's just a, that's a human, human fact. It's a human fact. And, and, and listening to that has impacted the game negatively. So when you take a bunch of guys whose ceiling is as a reliever or ceiling is as a six-hitter bat, what do you do? You got to have some kind of place to fall down, and and, and one, one of the things that Mike used to say, which I really liked, was that there was a a, a best scenario, there was a worst case scenario, and there's a likely scenario. Well, if your best case scenario is what you think the likely scenario is, what happens if it doesn't happen? Then what? So, I I can't in any, I I it's 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 a bad draft for me. It's a bad, it's a safe draft. It is a non-impactful draft where you might find a couple of pieces, and that's fine for when the window is alive. But what happens when it's not? And that's the best way I can put it. What happens when it's not? Because after this, the Astros still have to play baseball. And after Mike Elias and Jeff Luno are gone, and this team has, has broken up, because it will break up mm -hmm. at some oh, point. They always do. They always do. Then what? Then we go back to four, three, 300 lost seasons in a row? Then what? You, you have an obligation to keep filling the coffers the best you can. And I don't think they did that. I just don't. It will be fascinating to track this class, much like last year's class. It will be fascinating to track this class because, to me, it, it just uh, – and I have no problem with it because I'm fascinated by the means of doing this. But, to me, the first thing that I think of is Moneyball Draft, the 2002 A's Draft. That's the first thing I think of when I look at these names. You know, and the A's taking Kyler Murray, albeit a risky pick. Huge risk. And Addison Russell – and Billy McKinney, right, and guys like that they've taken who are high school or athletic shows you how far away they've come in 16 years from Moneyball. And I'll admit, I actually defer. I prefer college guys because I think that there's more of a track record. That's me. Sure. Are you a, more of a college guy, a high I'm school neither. guy? I'm, I'm, or you're just a guy guy. Give me I'm, the guys not, who can I'm play. Not, I want guys who can play. I want guys that have roles. I want guys that can build into value. You have to balance. Not everybody's an aircraft carrier. You have to be able to take guys <laughs> that, are, that are balancing. You have to be able to take guys that have track record. You have to be able to see the intangibles. College baseball will give you – Track record. It's one thing it will do. It's recorded different. It's much less subjective um, from a standpoint of statistics than it is than, than high school can be. And and it's unifying. I, I, get, I get it. I'm not. I drafted a first a, a number one pick in Taylor Youngman in 2011, who was a college warrior mm -hmm. who won the Dick Hauser Award, which is a leadership award, and for one of the best player in America, uh, best player in college baseball that year. Similar to Golden Spikes, although you know, although different. He's he's pitching in Japan. Why? Because he couldn't get, he didn't have the ceiling of the guy we took behind him, God rest, or was taken behind him, God rest him, of Jose Fernandez. We ran from Jose Fernandez for Taylor Youngman, and I love Taylor to death, I really do. But who would you rather have had, all things considered? How are you not taking that guy? The Seattle Mariners took Danny Holtzson and passed on Francisco Lindor. 
And that's Whoops. what makes it so great. Right. So you have to you can't you can't go one way or the other, man. And kudos to the Cleveland Indians for taking Noah Naylor, and kudos to the Mets for taking Kellenic, and kudos for to, for uh, the Rays for taking Liberatory, and the guys that went that college or high school. Groshans went what twelve? Yeah, Groshans to, is one of the two kids from Magnolia who, um, you know, were projected in the top fifty players yeah. in the draft. Yeah. But kudos to teams like that who recognize they have a chance to impact the organization instead of just be part of the organization. And it's those, I know those guys are high school guys. There's college players. Casey Mize with the Tigers, congratulations. Good for you. Um, Jonathan India with the Reds, good for you. And all the guys that want to be – those guys can, be, can impact the organization. And I know the Astros are picking 28. They're not picking one, two, three, or four. But they had, a, they had, they had players fall into their laps they could have done something with, and they didn't do it. Quickly, Baseball America did the home run location tracker for the top college hitters from the 2018 draft. I wish I had the time to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. But what they did was they tracked all the home runs – and it's you know their pref their their premise of this is that when you look at some of the top college power hitters Chris Bryant Kyle Schwarber Nick Senzel Kyle Lewis Senzel's now with the Reds Kyle Lewis is a off injured prospect with, with the Seattle, Mariners right. who I'm a big fan of I just want this guy to get healthy me too they talk about all fields all right you look at the two best power hitters in this draft or three mm -hmm. Joey Bart right catcher yeah. Georgia Tech Georgia Tech sure. Um, the outfielder, Oregon State, Trevor uh, Larnick. Larnick. I saw him in high school, too. And the Wichita State third baseman, Alec Boom. Boom. Those guys use the field, the oh. entire field. In fact, their pull percentage, uh, Boom is at 18%, Bart is at 18%, and Larnick is at 6%. And the launch angle gurus are going to lose their mind because all they teach about is sit and spin and yank for, yank for power for one side. Seth Beer... It's amazing that the uh -oh. that the Astros are very much this team that employs shifts and loves shifts. Uh oh. Well, guess what? What? There's going to be a lot of shifting on Seth Beer. Oh. oh, oh. Nine of that. his twenty home runs, right? Twenty. Nine of his twenty home runs to right field, two to right center field, three to center. So his pull percentage is at sixty percent. Hmm. Imagine that. Imagine that. And that's what they took was a pull power guy who has to hit with no position. I took him in the first round. Took him in the first round. We'll see. And we'll then see. I, and then I also want to mention this, and I think it's I, – I, I will say I think it's a little unfair to label guys as hit or misses from the draft before because okay. I think guys certainly need some time they to develop. I, I would definitely agree with that. Baseball America said hits and disappointments. The title of the article says hits and misses, right. but then when you dive into it, it says hits and disappointments, and I think that – Certainly is a better a better description of guys who are quote misses. They're more of a disappointment at this time. That one's interesting. And I'm not gonna say that JB Bacoskis is a disappointment, but that's what baseball America labels him right now as a disappointment. That after three stellar years at North Carolina, Slider regarded as one of the best breaking pitches in the country. Um this year, he's gotten hit hard in two Midwest League outings before going on the disabled list with an oblique strain. Scouts who have seen Bacoskis pitch said his stuff itself looks fine, though the results clearly have not matched the stuff. That's your first pick last year. J.B. Bukoskis, another guy that went to college early and said, don't draft me. And I don't know, maybe there's a theme. I don't know. Maybe there's a theme. you got to want to do this, and, and – you know, he's a reliever for me. I've said this the whole time. We talked about it before. He was a, one of the earlier shows. He was a Sonny Gray mm -hmm. comparison by some people. And I said, I you were like, whoa, you out. slammed the brakes on that time one. Out. You know, but, you know, what Sonny Gray had is, is as good as his stuff is. Sonny Gray has heart. You can't measure it in the side of the football stadium. And you can't pitch and, or play professionally without having it. And I'm not saying JB doesn't have it. What I am saying is that sometimes these things you see with your own eyes by getting to know people off video and off spin rates give you an indication of what they are. And that's what scouts can measure beyond the tools. Because anybody can see a radar gun and see a stopwatch and see how far the ball is hit. I can see it's, that. Anybody can see that. You have to be able to take that and center what these guys are. And the Astros clearly don't have an appreciation for that or didn't because of the way they draft and the way they set up their year. And I think they um, know – I let me rephrase that. I know they know the industry perception of them at this point. They drafted I know. that way. Uh, on the flip side of that, the hits, one of the hits, if you will, from this article in Baseball America, 
Corbin Martin, mm -hmm. Texas A&M Cy Ranch product, who is one of the first players from that draft class last year to reach double A. After being primarily used as a reliever at Texas A&M, he's seen a lot of time in the rotation. He has blown through Bowie's Creek. Uh, where he allowed just four hits in 19 innings. And now, after a really rough start in Double A, he had a very solid start last night. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's a guy with a mid-90s fastball. He's got a quality, couple of quality breaking pitches. And, I, you know, here's a guy, uh, friends of mine had him in Alaska, where he was a lights-out pitcher there. He was lights-out as a reliever in the Cape Cod League. Yep. Is he a starter or is he a reliever? He's a reliever, and he's a guy that probably sits in the seventh inning. Okay. And they took him in the second round? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, look, relievers are volatile, mm -hmm. right? So, he can be a closer. For all we know, he's Ken Giles, and for all we know, he's he's Dennis Eckersley or something like that. Or he could be Lee Smith, Trevor Hoffman. But bottom line is this guy is probably a seventh inning guy. Um, he's got a good arm. He had a good arm in high school at Cy Ranch where I saw, I saw him there. Mm -hmm. He had a good arm at Texas A&M. He's got a track record, and they took him in the second round. Second round? Or third yep. round. Second, Second round. round. So, I mean, Second you round. can get that type of guy there after you get take your first pick. But they went with two relievers last year, one and two, mm. because of velocity, because of spin rates and things like that. The ro doesn't change the role, by the way, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. change the role. But if he's an impact reliever in the big leagues, that's a win. It balances out Bukowskis. Okay. Let's go now to this tweet that you sent out 17 hours ago. Okay. The Astros miss Alonzo Powell in a big way. The human element can't be overstated in this game, although some people would have you believe otherwise. Do the Astros miss Alonzo Powell and why? Well, you said they did, so you've answered that first part. So why do they miss Alonzo Powell? You know, Jason, Alonzo Powell had a lot to do with organizational philosophy, even though he wasn't the the, the, the main the, the hitting, hitting coach. coach. Yeah. He was the assistant hitting coach here. And he was a guy, a guy that a lot of guys went to. Mm -hmm. It's nothing against Hudgens. It's nothing against the guys that have been there. But um, Alonzo has an engaging way about him, and he has a way that connects to players and gets them to understand who they are and how to deliver, which is why the Giants hired him away from here. Yeah. Okay. Also, he, he has a very close connection with Hensley, Hensley Mullins, right. who played in Japan, and Alonzo played in Japan. So I know for a fact that they're very close. And plus, Alonzo's a Bay Area guy. Absolutely. There's a lot of reasons why he got his ring and went yep. back to San Francisco. And, you know, it's, that happens in baseball. But that's the point. The Astros miss that cohesiveness. They miss that steadying presence. They miss the the hand on, on people. And sometimes, you know, Alex Cora is not here anymore either. And he's a manager with the Red Sox. And sometimes you, you don't see that until it's gone. That's a fact, right? You don't appreciate it till it's gone. But they miss that unifying presence, and they miss that connection to be able to teach them who they are and get the best out of them. Every player hears something, hears, hears something different no matter how it's put to them. Jason's going to hear something different than I am, than George Springer is, than A.J. Reed, than J.D. Davis, and Alex Bregman. It just, it's, it's, things connect differently. And Alonzo Powell had a good way of doing that and also helping these guys stay on track. Offensively, they haven't got on track. Mm -hmm. For me, the entire year, they haven't been who they should be. Okay, because now we're a couple months in, two and a half months in, and they should be somebody different, and they're not. Um, the human element, you can't just replace people. Not everybody's replaceable. People have, a, have to have a, have a different way in a different clubhouse, and some people are good fits and some people aren't. And if you're continuing to just do it on paper and do it on numbers and do it, do it different ways, eventually that's going to bite you. You have to have human people in a human game. And one, one thing that has really struck me, and I remember A.J. Hinch, beginning of the season, really stressed about how much he thought the bottom of this lineup would help, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't play like a bottom right. of the lineup. Right. And unfortunately, at this point, it has not done that because the bottom of the lineup, for the most part, has been a disappointment, has, has struggled immensely. It's, it can't just ever be three guys, right? It can't be three guys. What's Bregman hitting, 260? You know, he's sitting 260. It was 258 last night, something like that. Um, Gonzalez has never – Marwin hasn't really got on track all year. Um, you know, stassi has been a surprise when mm -hmm. he's played. Yep. McCann, you know, hasn't done a ton. I mean, these guys haven't done – the pieces haven't done a whole lot. Gurriel is starting to get, do a little better. But, um, you know, Correa and Altuve and Springer have been carrying this club. Yep. And that's what superstars do. But what about the rest of the guys, right? You can't win a baseball game with three – with computers, with, with analytics, and with three players. You can't do it. Keiko last night – is absolutely torched by the Seattle Mariners and, and had to go out and wear it a little bit. I think he put out there, he's going to have to eat some innings. Yeah, right? and he did. And he had to wear to it. To his credit, he did. He had to wear it, and that's that's part of it. But that's because the bullpen in high leverage situations has been so beat up, you can't go save Keiko right there. All right, Jeremy, uh, we're having a little technical issues with your mic, so we're going to wrap this puppy up. You've been listening to Extra Bases with Bristol and Booth. For Jeremy Booth, I'm Jason Bristol, and we can't wait to talk to you next time. Take care, everybody.